I'm humbled to be in the room. I can hardly, how did you not mention this? You can't see anyone. <laughs> I can hear you all in the back of the room, but um, I'm certainly humbled to be here in a room full of tremendous um, people and physicians, all of us who um, share a passion for what we do for our patients every day. So we like to tell stories, although it, it, it occurs to me as physicians, we oftentimes can't share our stories out of respect for the confidentiality of our patients, but tonight we're sharing. And my story begins actually as a medical student at Brown University. I was visiting there yesterday. Uh, medical school, we learned that we should take a sexual history from patients. Do you remember the history and physical examination course? And your teachers would check with their patients to see if you could stop by and practice asking all those questions and doing the physical exam. And at Brown, the teachers were geriatricians. And they told us that the sexual history was just part of the regular history and everybody should ask the questions unless there was a very, very good reason not to. And age was not a reason to not ask the questions because the geriatricians were real advocates for the older patients. So I went off to Rhode Island Hospital. This made sense to me, by the way. I didn't find it particularly shocking or unusual. Went to Rhode Island Hospital where most of the patients were older men in hospital gowns, sometimes two or three to a room, not looking particularly happy, not feeling well, of course, because they were in the hospital, and now doing a favor for their physician to answer the questions and be examined over and over again by medical students. And it was at the point in the history where I said, well, and do you have a sexual partner? And what's that like? And how's your sex life? Where the man went from being a sick older patient to a person with a twinkle in his eye and a story to tell. <laughs> I thought this was very interesting and exciting. And as a medical student, all we want to do is something that makes our, the patients feel better. And usually we're just um, superfluous. We have no role. We're aggravating and annoying. But it seemed that asking the sexual part of the history was a way to connect with people. And it became an interest uh, for me for my research. So fast forward a few years later, now I'm a resident in obstetrics and gynecology here in Chicago at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. I'm on call, I'm taking care of patients on the gynecology oncology service. And it was one of those nights where you can see maybe you're gonna get some sleep. So I went, to, I, I went to the 14th floor and I thought I'll tuck in my patients. You have this idea if you just tuck them in, then everything will be okay. And I stopped in to see Mrs. Jones, we'll call her, who was there, her family had brought her in. She was really at the end of her life with endometrial cancer. And they brought her to the hospital for us to help her die in peace. And I said to Mrs. Jones, if something should happen to you tonight, tell me what should we do? Who would be the person to call to help make a decision on your behalf? And her son stepped forward and he had his business card ready with his phone number. And he said, if anything should happen, you should call me. And I sort of surveyed the room, including Mrs. Jones, and I got the scent, the, no the heads were nodding, and I thought, okay, this is fine. I tucked it into my pocket, I said good night, and of course, let's hope everything, it'll be a peaceful night. And I went back down to the call room, and I took off my pink, dirty clogs and left them by the door, got into bed, and the phone rang, and it was the nurse from the 14th floor, and she said, Mrs. Jones' family has left, and she'd like to speak with you. I went back to the room, and she was holding another piece of paper with another man's name and a different phone number. <laughs> and she said, Dr. Lindau, something should happen tonight. This is who you need to call. So I said, well, who is this? And she said, well, my family knows him as my next door neighbor. But I've been a widow, Dr. Lindau. I've been a widow for a long time. And this man is my companion. He's my partner and he's my lover. And my family doesn't know that. But if something should happen to me, he's the person you should call. So I said, well, let's hope it's a peaceful night. <laughs> and I went back downstairs. Of course, there was no more sleep. And I felt a terrible ethical dilemma. And in fact, um, working with the McLean Center in Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago has become part of my pursuit to try to understand the ethics of um, caring for patients. But I thought, you know, this is really unfair. This woman, here she is at a critical moment of her life, really the end of her life. And she couldn't even share with her family the fact of this person, who she wanted to make the most important decisions for her. She couldn't share that relationship, and nor could she gain the full benefit of that relationship. And I started to think about how sexuality was related to health, not just through uh, the transmission of disease or pregnancy um, or the pleasure that makes us feel healthy and well, but also how important our intimate partners are for these critical moments in life. So fast forward a few more years, and we conduct a national study on sexuality and aging, and we publish it in the New England Journal of Medicine. David Letterman makes it his top 10 that night. So 
clearly I've peaked, but really the peak moment <laughs> um, was when Dr. Diane Yamada, who heads the section of gynecology and oncology at the University of Chicago, said to me, you know, the research you're doing is great. Can we bring it to practice so that we can improve care for sexual issues for our patients who have cancer? So you've had a few minutes to think about it, and so those of you who don't take care of people with sexual concerns or cancer might wonder what the two have to do with each other. But I think if you think about it for just a second, you realize that the vast majority of cancers, women and men survive, are those that directly affect the sexual organs. Prostate cancer, breast cancer, gynecologic cancers, colorectal cancer. And for men, if we look at prostate cancer care, we've come a long way, and prostate cancer care sets an excellent example of how physicians can openly talk with their patients about sexual issues and can say to men, if you choose option A, this is what you can expect for your sexual function, and for option B, you could expect this. Unfortunately for women's cancer care, we're further behind. Cancer doctors need to cure cancer, and that's what patients and doctors, when we're facing these scary times, really need to do. But addressing the issue of sexuality and giving women, giving women information so they can know that if they experience a problem, it's not just in their head, it might have to do with the treatments, like the removal of the breasts or the removal of, or radiation of the, the genital organs, or it might be due to the drugs that we give them. So patients know they're not alone if they experience these symptoms that it's not just in their head, that it's not just that they're not trying hard enough, and that we can be there to help them. And that's what our program has been about. I want to end, since we like stories so much, with inspiration for me that comes from um, great American fiction. Ralph Ellison is a, um, a fiction writer who wrote a book called Invisible Man. And he talked about the invisible and the unvisible. And we've seen that medicine brings us ways for seeing the invisible, x-rays and CAT scans and microscopes, things we can't see because of the physical limitations of our eyes. But for me, and if you think about it, I imagine for you, our patients show us about the invisible, things that we don't see because we don't want to look down there, things we don't see because of biases or prejudices in our society. And to me, one of the great privileges of being a physician is learning to see the invisible through the eyes of my patients. Thank you very much.